Imagine this. You're in first grade and you spent the entire day at school working on a drawing. So obviously, the minute you get home, you run towards your parents eager to present your masterpiece, to only find that when you present it to them, they paid little attention and eventually, they put it in the shredder. This is how we treat our food. We frankly don't appreciate it. The farmer producing our food works tirelessly to only find that when it's presented to us, we, the everyday people, pay little attention to the hard work and labor, and eventually, we throw it out. When most people are asked where their food comes from, they quickly respond with the grocery store. And when we're prompted further into the life of the fruits, vegetables, meats, and grains before the grocery store, we're stuffed. And I'm not surprised. A couple months ago, just a few days before Thanksgiving, I was asked if I'd like to assist in harvesting turkeys at the farm where I spent the majority of the past summer as an intern. Now, me and this farm, we go way back. I started volunteering about six years ago, slowly working up to more difficult tasks. I took classes here, was able to teach them too, and learned how to appreciate my food. Over the summer, one of the most important things we were tasked with was harvesting fruit, specifically raspberries. Entire weeks were spent at the top of the field picking raspberries. Until then, I never understood how hard this task really was. The first couple of hours, they always started off great. You pick some, then ate some, and pick some more while talking to the people around you. And since you always start off in the morning, the sun created the perfect berry picking temperature. But as the day goes on, it becomes hard to tell the difference between a ripe berry and an unripe one. And it seems as though that all you can see are berry bushes. The task becomes mind-numbing, and as the sun climbs higher into the sky, the hotter and more humid it gets. For raspberries, the peak season is at the end of June to the beginning of July, and for those weeks, all we could do is eat, sleep, dream, and think of harvesting these fruits. It even got to the point where entire day's discussion with some of their interns was, what a berry truly is. And what we discovered is that most fruit that people commonly perceive to be berries actually aren't. Raspberries and blackberries are not actually berries. They're aggregate fruits. Look it up if you don't believe me. This came as such a shock that we even ended up teaching a class about it. Anyway, as the weeks went on, I began to see each bag of berries with the value associated to it. I looked at bag of berries and saw the price and how much hard work it took to harvest. By the end of berry picking season, I had a pretty killer farmer's tan. The palms of my hands were continuously tinted pink. And I started to understand the labor behind harvesting fruit. As I said earlier, I've been slowly moving up to more difficult tasks on the farm. And to this date, harvesting turkeys has been the most difficult one. It was seven o'clock on a foggy morning as the sun started to rise a week before Thanksgiving, as I headed up to the Western barn. I was feeling nervous, excited, and reluctant. The day ahead of me felt daunting. I had never killed an animal before, had never even been fishing, and I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to handle the blood and guts. I didn't have a specific task, and I just didn't know what to expect. We all met in the livestock office, and I was the youngest of the group by at least 10 years. So as I looked around the room, I felt a sinking sensation. I didn't feel as though I fit in with the group. Never in a million years would anyone outside the farm picture me here, with this group of people especially doing this task. I was inexperienced, and the last thing I wanted to do was hold back the group. By the end of the day, our goal was to finish the remaining turkeys, which was nearing 200. And as I looked around at the crew, some of whom I recognized from this past summer, I started to understand the magnitude of what we had to complete. None of us were leaving until the remaining turkeys had been soldered, eviscerated, chilled, prepped, and packaged. We all gathered in the mayhem of assigning and claiming roles, I somehow ended up in the evisceration group. There's only room for about six people at the evisceration table, which dips in the middle to catch the blood and guts. Hanging over the table are hooks to hang the turkey from, and there's a small ledge where you can place your knife. I did some math. Each of us will average around 33 turkeys by the end of the day. We made small talk as the first few turkeys were being slaughtered in the room next to us. The two rooms are connected with the defeathering machine, which quickly spins the dead turkeys, pulling feathers along with it, and suddenly I heard thudding as the machine started to spin. Everything in the room became tense, and the small talk subsided. 
The six of us, Inspector and I, as well, waited for the sound of the thudding to stop. The door to the machine opened, and out came a jerky. Most of his feathers were gone. It was still warm, being was killed only three minutes ago, and the neck and feet were still attached. A guy waiting by the machine plucked the remaining feathers, cut off the neck and feet, and removed the crop, which is part of the digestive system. The woman next to me grabbed the turkey by its thigh and placed it on the hook above the table. She said that she was going to go through the motion slowly and let me watch, then watch me try it on my own. I watched as she swiftly cut a small line between the two thighs, creating the, creating the cavity shown behind me. You know where you put the butter and herbs when you cook your turkey. Then she slowly reached into the cavity, demonstrating the cupping motion she made with her hands as she scraped around the sides of the inside of the turkey. At this point, I was fully absorbed in the task at hand, trying my best to memorize the steps and motions that I would have to replicate in a couple minutes. She continued, reaching back down to the cavity, scooping out the innards. She cupped the warm heart and liver, and I stood stunned. I was surprised to see a heart, and my head exclaimed, holy, that's a heart. She's really, really holding a heart. And immediately after, I felt embarrassed for feeling so surprised. Of course that's a heart. It's an animal, for goodness sake. Now, this is a crucial so-called discovery that I made. Yes, it was not my smartest, but my surprise at there being a heart, I learned, was not uncommon. And this, this is concerning. Before you ask, no, I was not grossed out. Frankly, because I had no time to even contemplate to be finicky about the blinding guts that lay before me. Then it was my turn to replicate the steps that had just been shown to me. I made the first cut, creating the cavity, and reached into the steam of turkey. It was a lot warmer than I expected. I just saw it to the inside, separate the heart and liver, and separate the heart and liver, and reach back down to scrape out the lungs. This is by far the hardest thing to learn how to do, but once you've got it, it's pretty easy. At this point, I was standing elbow deep into a clear cavity. The woman next to me was trying to describe their location and means of extracting them, which could only be done by fiddling around. So by the time I obtained the lungs, dare I say, I had a pretty intimate relationship with this turkey. <laughs> we worked for 10 hours, taking a break only to have lunch and some coffee. Though time flew by, I don't think anyone stopped moving until the task had been completed. I was shocked when I took off my gloves and saw my blood-stained hands. I scrubbed them for a while in the sink in the barn, and then proceeded to take a very long shower when I got home. Though my hands were still tinted a slight pink color for the next couple of days. I was exhausted, but later that night, my friends and I had planned a Friendsgiving, a Thanksgiving with the friends, and the questions and conversations that flowed from that night and Thanksgiving dinner itself opened my eyes and eventually inspired this talk. That night at dinner and for the following weeks, I was hammered by friends and family with all kinds of questions regarding the harvest. As they chewed and enjoyed their food, they asked the one question that almost everyone started off the bat with, which was, wasn't it gross? Now, the irony of this question is that it was almost always asked during a Thanksgiving meal, while they were eating a turkey. Every aspect of this is ironic because one, it's during a Thanksgiving meal, a time to be grateful. And two, I'm being asked if something is gross while I watch them eat it. Not to mention that it just happened to be from the same farm. And what I began to realize is that no one else seemed to understand the irony of the entire situation. And if I didn't have this experience, I wouldn't have either. I would have asked the same questions. I mean, how many people do you know who have harvested the vegetables that you're eating and butchered the meat that's in front of you? This overall process of harvesting has become so abstract that at some point in time, it has been an essential part of our existence and survival. Throughout history, humans have had a deep connection to food for the simple reason that we depend on it. For most of our existence, we've been hunter-gatherers. Though the concept of agriculture evolved from hunters and gatherers to early farming, agriculture has driven civilization. This revolution of thought led to cities and life as we know it today. As technology has made food more accessible, our relationship with food has faded away from this nomadic nature to early markets, cities, grocery stores, and eventually delivery services. As a result of all this, humans have been losing their deep connection to food. From hunting to the concept of farming and eventually supermarkets, an increasing large portion of the population can't name where their food was grown, slaughtered, or harvested. And most importantly, they have lost the appreciation of the labor and valuable resources required to produce it. This has created, especially in our country, 
a seemingly nonchalant relationship with food. Anyone can change their relationship with food, no matter your age, socioeconomic class, location, or current perspective. We, all, we have all been either the child bringing home the drawing or the person receiving it. And sadly, we know that these moments don't last forever. In the same sense, we need to start viewing our food as a gift. So, you're, so the next time you're handed a plate of food, think about the labor. Think about the literal blood, sweat, and tears that goes into harvesting your food. Think about the hours in the sun, the months it took to grow, maintain, and tend to your food. I implore you to think deeper into the migrant worker, the farmer, the people. Think about their hardworking and humble lifestyle dedicated to the one goal, to provide us food. Thinking and appreciating is free, and it's a first step to creating a world of change. It's a first step to seeing food as a finite source, thinking about the origins of your food and supporting local farmers, creating less waste, seeing the importance of sustainability, and much, much more. It can open the door to a different mindset and lifestyle. These are the hands that are producing your food. Whether it be raspberries or turkeys, both experiences left my hands physically imprinted with the stains of the labor required and emotionally impacted my journey of understanding our food system and our role in it. Thank you.